So Hobbes would say it's a complicated long switch that in fact for a human being sometimes mm, the circuits are complicated enough that uh, it doesn't result what doesn't result immediately in a desire or going toward the thing or away from the thing. So um, it doesn't have to be for Hobbes it doesn't have to be fixed. But maybe you're meaning something else. Maybe you're suggesting what's missing here is something like deliberation. So for Hobbes, there's a circuit that may be very complicated, but maybe you want to suggest it's not really a choice. Right. What, what about neutrality in general, then? What about neutrality in general? I mean, what if you would neither have a diversion or over, whether you have an aversion or a desire towards? Well, Hobbes thinks we can be indifferent. Yeah, that's what I mean. Sure, no, Hobbes doesn't have a problem with that. So there's some things that, you know, I don't exactly run away from, but I'm not exactly running toward it. I have to take it or leave it. Sure, so I could have, I, I certainly can encounter objects like that that are going to leave a memory in my mind, in my brain, that doesn't lead me either to run after it or away from it. Sure. What about things that aren't objects that cause you to run away or run after, like um, emotions towards a person? Run towards your lover, run away from an abuser? How would that be any different? <clears throat> it's emotionally driven, I was just curious. But... Right, well, so emotions are going to have some complicated Circumism. physiological explanation as well, sure. Yeah, yeah I was going to ask this how does it account for where these desires and versions arise from? Um, so these have to do with physiology. So he doesn't have an account of the development of human brains over time. So he doesn't have an evolutionary account, for example. But he studied this natural object that we find in the world. And he's giving an account of how to understand its behavior. Okay, well, so for sure we're going to come back to worry about this kind of materialism. Um, this is going to be an important um, point that uh, Kant will talk about. Okay. So I want to move on. Chapter 6. At the bottom, very bottom of page 28, we have an example where certain words are used. Here's the technical term that we mentioned, I think, last time inconstantly. So the example of the use of two words inconstantly is the following paragraph 7. He says, but whatsoever is the object of any man's appetite or desire. Okay, so we just had an account of what appetite or desire is. When there's a imagining in our brain that leads us to move in the direction of something. Or require. That's what it means to have the desire for that thing. Okay, one more time. But whatever is the object of any man's desire, appetite or desire, that is it which, for his part, calleth good, and the object of his hate and aversion evil, and of his contempt, that is, indifference, vile, and inconsiderable. For these words of good, evil, and contemptible are always or ever used with relation to the person that uses them, there being nothing simply and absolutely so. There's nothing that is simply and absolutely good or evil. I'm probably going to talk more about good and bad. Hobbes' point is there's nothing that is simply good or simply bad, absolutely good or absolutely bad. When we use these words to describe something as good or bad, what we're doing is 
simply saying, I have a desire for the thing, or I have an aversion for the thing, are always used in relation to the person that uses them, there being nothing simply and absolutely so. Nor is there any common rule of good and evil to be taken from the nature of the objects themselves. The only way we can identify something as good or bad is taken when it's taken from the person of the man, when there's no commonwealth, or in commonwealth from the person of the, that represents the commonwealth, or from the arbitrator or judge who men disagree shall by consent set up and make his sentence the rule thereof. Okay, so this is a crucial passage for Hobbes. Nothing is intrinsically good or bad. Nothing is in itself good or bad. Those words simply reflect the desires or aversions that the person using those words has for some object. So they are always used relative, those words are always used relative to the subject, relative to the attitude of the person using those words. Or, notice the other possibility here. Uh, when we set up an arbitrator or judge whose judgment will be substituted for our own, well, in that case, we simply take their judgment as good or bad, concerning whether something is good or bad, and substitute it for our own, just like the case we started with today. Okay, so I said that this was an inconstant, this is Hobbes' example of an inconstant use of words. Why? Anybody remember what the definition of an inconstant word is? Yeah. Was that something like a different meaning in different situations? Right, no, different meaning in different situations, or different meaning when spoken by different people. So somebody has a desire to do something that's going to you know, become bad, and then the other person is going to have, oh, it's going to become good. Right, then, so I have a desire for chocolate ice cream. Because I have a desire for it, I say, that's good. You, <coughs> you don't like it, you have an aversion to it. What do you say about it? It's bad. Which, which just means, when you say it, that you have an aversion to it. So each of us, notice in this case, I say it's good, you say it's bad. There's a sense in which there's a disagreement here. But for Hobbes, there's also a sense in which there's not a disagreement here. When I use this word, I say, I have a desire for it. When you say it's bad, you say you have an aversion to it. Both of those might be true. Okay. So it's a kind of funny thing that happens here where on the one hand, we're disagreeing. On the other hand, maybe we're not exactly disagreeing. Um, the point is that, well, the point is that there's not going to be any way of resolving that apparent conflict, apparent disagreement. Or that I say it's good. Maybe we, look, here, take another example. Maybe we both have des a desire for ice cream. I say it's good. You say it's good. OK, well, you might think that we're in agreement there. But actually, what I'm saying is I have a desire for it. And what you're saying is you have a desire for it. Well, maybe there's not enough ice cream for both of us. And so although it looks like we're in agreement, actually, we're disagreeing. I think it would be good for me to have it. You think it would be good for you to have it. Those are different things that we're calling good. One more time. I say it's good. You say it's good. But really what I'm saying is I have a desire for me to have it. 
And you're saying you have a desire for you to have it. Well, for Hobbes, there's not going to be any way of reasoning through who's right about this. Because, in a sense, we're both right. There's not going to be any way of rationally assessing which would be better. And so, put it this way, the ice cream itself isn't better when I have it or you have it. In other words, there's a rejection of a teleological metaphysics. We can't look to the object themselves to see what their ends are. We can't look to the objects themselves to see what their good, what would be good for them. Because there's nothing that's good for objects just taken in themselves. Very strong rejection of a teleological metaphysics here. So values assessments of good and bad, assessments of how good something is for Hobbes, are subjective. They're not built into the objective structure of the world. They simply reflect the attitude of subjects toward those things. Um, now, it's... Yeah. Uh, I understand how this works on objects. What about something more general like happiness? You said nothing is other than the value. Right. So I want to ask you, who's happiness? <laughs> well, does it have to be someone's happiness? Can it just be happiness in general? Free floating happiness? Free floating happiness. Um, well, we can say, uh, so maybe, maybe we can answer that question, move toward answering that question. Um, um, by thinking first about someone's happiness. Well, what, what are we going to talk about? Who's happiness? Yeah, well, so maybe we can move toward that by talking about the person's happiness. So there really can't, for Hobbes, there really can't be just happiness floating around. Happiness is going to be a, a kind of psychological state of a person. So, um, um, what, what is, so, um, it is possible that maybe as a biological necessity, human beings are structured so that they all, they all have certain desires in common. In that case, they're all going to call certain things, maybe happiness is an example, good. So each one will say, sincerely and accurately, that object is good, happiness is there's all, there's going to, we can imagine that there's going to be agreement with that statement. But of course, I want to say again, um, that, that's hiding a kind of discipline. So the happiness for one person may not be the same as the happiness for another. Well, it certainly is not. In other words, so happiness is a little bit funny there because it has to do with satisfaction. Of the <laughs> But take a